with water shortages. Liberia's Prince Johnson is halting his support for President George Weah's ruling coalition, at least for now. I have told the MDR to put all activities to a halt until we review the previous agreement in which certain positions were allotted to us. And we'll have reaction from Senegal to the loss of the African champions at the World Cup. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. The East African community postponed a third round of peace talks between the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, and rebel groups in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, saying conditions weren't right. The talks by the seven-nation group are being held in parallel with peace talks in Angola between the presidents of Burundi, the DRC, and Rwanda. Kinshasa has accused Kigali of supporting the M23 rebels in the DRC, a charge that Rwanda denies. Mohamed Yusuf reports from VOA's Africa News Center in Nairobi. The Democratic Republic of Congo president met with his Kenyan counterpart in Kinshasa Monday to discuss security in the country and the region. The two leaders, Felix Chisekedi and Kenyan President William Ruto, met a week after Kenya sent some 900 troops as part of the East African Regional Force to Eastern Congo to quell the violence and disarm the rebels operating in the area. Ruto reaffirmed his country and the East African Community Regional Bloc's commitment to help Congo build a stable nation. We are committed under the East Africa community to do whatever it takes to support His Excellency the President, to support the government of DRC and the people of DRC so that we can have peace in this country. It is in our interest, collectively and individually, that we have a peaceful region. There are peace talks planned in Angola's capital, where President Shisekedi is expected to meet Rwandan President Paul Kagame after months of tension between the two neighbors over the rebellious activities in eastern Congo. Kinshasa is accusing Rwanda of supporting the M23 rebel group against its forces, a claim denied by Kigali. Planned talks in Nairobi between the Congolese government and the rebel groups that were scheduled for Monday have been postponed. Belize, Kerege, an independent political and security researcher in eastern Congo, says the success of talks between Kinshasa and Kigali can help ease tensions in the eastern part of the country. They should give more attention to the talks in Luanda and the president should continue to engage the Congolese people inside the country. He says the president needs to start the peace talks among all the Congolese people and we know what the Congolese want. The Congo's crisis needs to be solved by the Congolese themselves and their leaders inside the country, not outside. The resurgence of the rebel group M23 has threatened the peace in eastern Congo and displaced thousands in recent weeks. There is an ethnic component to the fighting in North Kivu. M23 is made up of mainly Tutsis and has accused the Congo government of failing to protect their families against other rebel groups in the region led by Hutus. The group has vowed to continue fighting until they are assured of their safety against other rebel groups and the Congolese army. Joel Baraka is a conflict and resolution researcher at the Paul Institute, a Congolese think tank. He says the president's policy throughout has been not to engage any talks with rebel groups in the country. Many countries would like to see dialogue. They have a lot of interest in Congo. They have companies and they don't like to see conflict, he says. For the president, there is an upcoming election and he wants to keep his promise. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, M23 rebels say direct talks without preconditions with the government will help resolve the ongoing conflict. They also denied reports that members of the group launched attacks on unarmed civilians in Goma over the weekend. This as former Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta, who was recently appointed as mediator to resolve the conflict in DRC, 
called for ceasefire. Lawrence Kanyuka is the political spokesperson for the M23 rebel group. He tells viewers Peter Clotty that the international community should pressure the government in Kinshasa to respect the existing ceasefire and hold talks with the fighters. I would like to thank, first of all, the Eastern African community, thank the African Union, the United States of America, the EU, and the United Nations for their effort to search for a political solution on ongoing crisis in the DRC. However, in regard to the ceasefire, the M23 has already signed a unilateral ceasefire on the 1st of April of this year. So that ceasefire is still in place. Nothing has changed. So to request the M23 to sign a ceasefire, we already have a ceasefire. What he's doing in the moment is just to defend itself against the ongoing attacks of the DRC government, who is attacking the innocent populations, and the, the M23 movement is actually protecting the civilian and protecting itself. But Lawrence, you cannot say the M23 is protecting civilians. It is the duty and the mandate of the government through the FARDC, the National Army and the law enforcement agencies to protect the citizens, not the duty of M23 rebels. If they are attacking you, they consider you to be an illegitimate force. One should know that we are Congolese. The M23 movement is a Congolese movement. And we have the right, like the rest of the Congolese in this country. However, when it comes for the protection of populations, the M23 will spare no effort to do so. The DRC government has failed to protect its citizen. What the M23 is doing in the moment is just protecting itself and protecting the citizens that the DRC government sending the plane and the tank and the helicopters to go to bomb and kill every day. Hence, create a humanitarian crisis that we have today. So, we like to tell the world that M23 is not a warmongering movement. We're here for peace. We ask for a direct dialogue with the DRC government in a way to sort this ongoing crisis politically. But, Loris, there were reports the M23 attacked villages in Goma. Church services and people have been frightened. So how can you, on one hand, be saying you are protecting the population, and on the other hand, you attack villages and people are scared to do anything? Who are you protecting then? These allegations are DRC government propaganda. It shall be known that the M23 has never targeted any civilian populations, nor launched any attack in Goma. As you said by the report you read, but I don't know where you get this report. But what we are sure of is that our civilian populations are being killed every day by the allies of the DRC government. Lawrence Kanyuka is the political spokesperson for the M23 rebel group in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He was speaking with viewers Peter Clotty. Longtime Liberian Senator Prince Johnson once considered the kingmaker in Liberian presidential politics, says he's ending his support for President George Weir, at least for now. In a message to his Nimba County citizens, Johnson said he may not endorse Weir in the coming 2023 elections because Weir's ruling coalition for democratic change, the CDC, has failed to fully implement, which he, Johnson, signed with then-candidate George Weir for Johnson's support. According to Senator Johnson, President Weir was supposed to develop Johnson's home county of Niba and provide jobs to the citizen. The U.S. government sanctioned Johnson last year for his alleged involvement in a pay-for-play funding program with the Liberian government that the U.S. government says involved millions of dollars. Johnson has denied the allegation. Johnson's critics say he's probably looking for attention or more money, but he tells me an agreement is an agreement, and the ruling We Are Coalition has failed to fulfill its end of the contract. You know, 2017 is the year CDC and the NGIO that I am the political leader of, to sign an agreement 
Uh, in that agreement, certain positions were allotted to our country and the party. But things have been happening that are not correct, number one. The political hierarchies of the CDC have not met the MDR political hierarchies since 2017. All communications to have them meet with us or for us to meet with them have never been possible. And those positions even not for us in the agreement. The president has given some, but those positions are not positions where you can employ people who also suffer. All the major ministries, major public corporations, and other agencies of government, they are all people from South Eastern region, to include the Supreme Court bench. Our agreement with the CDC from 2017, it ends this December ending. When a, a military unit is ordered to move for way march, they get to a place where they say, they hot, you're hot, and you get another order from the commanding officer before you move. I have told the MDR to put all activity to a halt until we review the previous agreement in which certain positions were allotted to us. Senator, when I spoke with you a year ago, I think you told me that uh, President Weir was implementing the Memorandum of Understanding by undertaking development projects in Nimba County. Now you are saying that uh, he is not, or the CDC is not fulfilling. No, 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 uh, no, no, no. no. Yes, but you're talking about development. I'm talking about positions in government. It is a prerogative of the president to develop the country. Nimba is no exception. Senator, what, what do you say to some people who, who might ask you, uh, are you backtracking because of the U.S. sanctions? Why are U.S. sanctions? The Treasury Department and you, but you know, you are a Liberian, not an American. I have never been appointed to any budgetary entity before to hand up money for which I must be audited. The ministry assets that ministry gave me millions of dollars to provide intelligence, which I did not do. Am I the, the intelligent arm of the government? No. Let me tell you, Mr. Botte, pay to play that language is the emanation of America. If you look at some of the people in present that is government, some of them ran against him. They may have contributed to his success. That's why he gave them that job. The way the agreement, this MOU, the way it sounds, uh, Senator, it sounds like uh, a quid pro quo that uh, you do this for me and I'll do that for you. I think that's what people are concerned about. Yeah, but Mr. Bote, politics is interest. Even Kamala Harris was running against uh, President Biden. There was a negotiation that went on before she was appointed as a running mate. Even the Secretary of Defense, there was an agreement in the if the black people vote, the black people will be giving cap portfolios in government. If I support you, what do we get in return? Give jobs to my people. So, Senator, suppose President Weir comes around tomorrow and appoints people from Niba County to key positions. Will you reverse uh, this so whole thing? That's what we're oh, that's correct, Jim Hunter. That's correct. We are saying to you, Niba is a big county. But about it, Niba is big. It can swallow all the country in the southeastern region. So why do you get member a uh, head out? We should be in the critical ministry to be able to employ our people too. Senator, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much. Jimmy, it's always a pleasure to respond, to let all Americans, our Liberian the diaspora, to understand our position. That I am completely innocent, so having God. That was Senator Prince Y. Johnson of Liberia speaking with us from the capital, Monrovia. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Tuesday, November 22nd. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.
preliminary results from Sunday's presidential elections in Equatorial Guinea indicate that longtime President Teodoro Obiang, the world's longest serving leader, was garnering 99 percent of the votes counted so far. If he wins, the 80 year old leader will be extending his 43 years in power. Enrique Okenve is professor of African history at the University of the West Indies at Mona, Jamaica. He tells me he is not surprised by the results because he says there has never been free and fair elections in Equatoria Guinea since the introduction of multi party system in the early 1990s. I guess 99% is a little bit too obvious, but I mean, this is hardly surprising considering that since multi-party politics was uh, started or re- established, re-established in Equatorial Guinea in the early 1990s, every presidential election since then, he has won elections by more than 90% of the votes. Uh, I think the, the lowest percentage that he ever got was in the last elections in 2016. He got 93% of the votes, but every other election has been around, in and around 95, 97, 98%. So these preliminary results are highly surprising. It might be a little bit lower in the final count, just to save face. But as I said, uh, no surprise there. And there have been numerous calls from political parties and civil society organizations that had been uh, denouncing the elections even before the elections were officially announced. Different political organizations and civil societies decided that we could not put in the elections because of the lack of guarantees. There there will not be free and fair elections. So as I said, the results are are no surprise. I'm reading that uh, 14 of 17 opposition parties joined the ruling party. Why is that? It is true that uh, for quite some time already, there is usually a coalition in which, like the ruling party, which is called um, DDGE, which means Democratic Party of Equatorial Guinea, just to make the process democratic or to appear democratic at least, there are several parties that participate in the elections along with the majority party, which is the PDGE. But really and truly, they are not in opposition. They support the ruling party in, in every parliamentary court, and they're just there to to sort of like make the the process seem uh, democratic, but I don't think there's any question in anybody's mind in Equatorial Guinea or anybody who knows anything about Equatorial Guinea that these are not members of the opposition. The problem with the other members of the opposition, the political parties, is that only a few of them are legalized. Multiple parties were legalized in the early 1990s, uh, but since then many of them have been made illegal on the basis of all kinds of different accusations. Some of them, for example, they were not made illegal, but simply they were co-opted by the ruling party and they have been internal divisions. So sometimes you will see is one faction of, of the initial party on the opposition and the other faction is now uh, in coalition with the ruling party. I said earlier about the 99%. President Teodoro Winnie is getting 99% of the vote so far and you said that's a little bit too high. Could it be also that maybe the people, <laughs> could it be maybe the people of Equatorial Guinea, they love him so much that uh, he's winning this, this much? The truth is that even if they love him so much, it's hard to tell because there is no mechanism in Equatorial Guinea to really know the true feelings and views of society. Outside the elections, we don't have any other mechanisms to get a sense of what people uh, think or what their views are. Enrique Okenve is professor of African history at the University of the West Indies at Mona, Jamaica. It has been a month since Tanzania's commercial capital Dar es Salaam put residents on water rations after a drop in the city's main water source, the Ruvu River. Authorities say the water supply problem is beyond their control, but critics see it as a failure to manage resources. Charles Kumbe reports from Dar es Salaam. 39-year-old Dar es Salaam resident Halima Athman buys water from a private well for her daily use. For more than a month, 
city residents like Athoman have been forced to buy water from commercial sellers due to a shortage of water supplied by the city. She says, before we were buying one gallon for 500 shillings, but now it is 1,500 to 2,000. For us citizens with low income, that is a lot of money. I have a family, so how many gallons should I buy? Athmani asks. So she added, it costs us a lot and we cannot afford it. At the end of October, authorities in Dar es Salaam declared a water shortage and began rationing in Tanzania's largest city, home to about 5 million people. Officials say due to drier conditions, the water supply from the Ruvu River, the city's main water source, has dropped to about 300 million liters a day, while the city demands 450 million liters. Critics say Tanzania's authorities should have done more to prepare for the drought. Boniface Jacob is the former mayor of Ubungo district. He says, we are blaming this on a lack of rain. What about those countries where they don't receive rainfall for a long time? Countries like the United Arab Emirates or Sahara Desert countries. Jacob asked that, is the government that lacks priority in the water sector. If not resolved soon, the water shortage could impact Tanzania's economy. The National Bureau of Statistics says Dar es Salaam accounts for 80% of the country's industrial activity, where the experts say an end to the shortage is in sight. Joyce Makwata is a meteorologist at the Tanzania Meteorological Agency. She says, we are heading into December. We are expecting an increase in rainfall. Rain will help in various economic activities. Makwata added that people will harvest water for domestic use and the water shortage will decline. Meanwhile, Athuman cleans with the little water she has and hopes for the rain and a sustainable water supply. Charles Kombe, for VA News, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. There were a lot of broken hearts yesterday around Africa, but especially in Senegal, when the African champions lost their opening match to Netherlands in the final minutes at the Qatar World Cup. Ibrahim Undia is a senior editor at Le Soleil, Senegal's daily newspaper. He tells me that the Lions of Teringa was the better team, but may have lost the game due to inexperience by their young players and a tactical choice on the part of their coach. We were very disappointed at the last because Senegal lost this game at the end. We had the potential to win it. Even Netherlands was not very, very, very good. Senegal was very good during the first period and we were able to win it. But unfortunately, it is a lack, a lack of experience for many of our players and maybe a tactical choice for the trainer. And I think that it is uh, the first game and it is very hard to be in. And maybe we'll have some real quiet for the next game. But it will be very difficult for each game because next time on Friday we'll meet the organizer, the Qatar, before the last country, Equator, who will, who will between Qatar. It will be very, very, very hard. Now we have three points with Equator and Senegal and Qatar zero points. So, Ibrahim, when you say also maybe it was due to tactical decision, you're talking about some decision made by the coach? So, of course, because, uh, you see, you have some players who are very old now, and you have young, young people. I think that you are not very courageous to take the young people in the beginning of the match. And it is one thing. And uh, when Abdul Jalo go out, he should bring someone, Ismail Jacob, who is Senegalese and from Germany too. And we had some problem about his citizenship. And it was, okay, just a few minutes before the match. So you cannot put a young, a young man like this for the first match. And I think that uh, we have many players who are in, then he not playing with the... We got to talk to him. 
And I think that we have the, the, the trainer and the staff have a big responsibility to what happened to this match. Ibrahim Antia is a senior editor at Le Soleil, Senegal's daily newspaper. He was speaking with us from Dakar. And that's it for this Tuesday, November 22nd edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for joining us this morning for more Africa.